Good morning to you. Sandy was talking with me earlier this morning about uh, some spiritual, I guess you'd call it spiritualist sorts of things. Uh, my teacher told a story one time, and he, he had a number of stories that he liked to tell. Uh, some of them proved that the Buddha was such an incredible person that he uh, would understand things like in science, like we have now. And he was always so pleased when science proved something he had said. You know, like one of, one of the, the common things that the Buddhists like to refer to, because we like to think of ourselves as being very scientific. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the scientific side. I'm just going to do a little intro to that. Then I'm going to talk about the, as Sandy calls it, the woo. She doesn't put the two woos together, you know. I'd never heard that before until a few years ago. And somebody said, woo, woo. And I said, well, you're talking about those candle shops, you know, where they sell crystals of power and things like that. Yeah, but she, she's abbreviated it, very American. Woo, she just calls it. And I think she's talking about a Chinese gentleman or something. <laughs> um, but the one that, uh, that people point out with the Buddha was that the Buddha realized that there were microbes of different types in, in water and in the air. And um, one of the foundational beliefs of Buddhism is ahimsa, which means to do no harm. And so for everyone, uh, this becomes a very personal thing, I think. When people take uh, Buddhist precepts, take refuge, and then uh, promise to keep the precepts, at first blush, it looks so straightforward, because we're not going to take life. Well, you know, okay, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Don't go buy a gun and shoot somebody. And then, then you're uh, putting down the ant traps. And you stop and realize, well, wait a minute, that's life. And uh, it just goes on and on like that. And everybody deals with it how they could deal with it. Because we're, I think one of the reasons why uh, people don't think Buddhism is a religion, not everybody believes that, but many people don't think Buddhism is a religion. They think it's a philosophy of life. And, and I have always stand in awe of someone who will tell me that Buddhism is not religion, it's simply a philosophy of life. And I'll go, so what does that mean? And, well, that's how you live your life. I said, well, isn't that what religion should be? How you live your life? Should religion be something that set us apart from your life? And of course, you know, you hear, you hear the Christians don't talk about, it. yeah, those guys, they're only good on Sunday. You know, and then the rest of the week they can get away with doing bad stuff. But the, the Buddha realized there were microbes because uh, he told the monks, one of the things monks get when they become a monk is a water strainer, which is really just a piece of cloth. And we've started giving handkerchiefs to new monks. Because I, I think it's just a piece of cloth and it has a sewn border on it. <laughs> you know, so it's going to last a long time. And so you pour your water through it. Now remember that the monks in the old days, they were, a lot of them were getting their water out of streams and out of lakes. And so when they poured the water through that cloth, they would see some of the little critters. And so then they were instructed by the Buddha to take the cloth and, and gently shake it out in the water so the little critters could escape and go away. And um, there's a great Zen lesson in this because then the monks became very proud that they were not taking life. And the Buddha said, well, uh, yeah, okay, fine. But the thing is that when you breathe, there are little critters in the air. And when you breathe, you're taking life. And there's little critters in the water that you don't see. So that when you drink water, just simply drink water. And heaven forbid that you were to boil water. You're going to be taking uh, the, the life of things. And then the apologists come along and go, well, you know, but it's a lower life form. Because within Buddhism, we have this notion of higher life forms and lower life forms. And to take a life of a higher life form uh, is not as uh, a nice thing to do compared to, well, we can, take, we can take the life of lower life forms because they're lower. 
So one day Tianan was asked, that was my teacher, he was asked, uh, so how do you figure out what's a higher life form and a lower life form? And he says, oh, that's easy. He said, higher life forms uh, move away from pain, move away from danger. Higher, higher life forms do not want to experience pain. So I thought about that, having a couple years of college under my belt at the time. And I remembered in biology when we had, uh, under the microscope, we had rotifers and amoebas and things like that, and we would take a little pokey thing. And what did they do? They moved away from the little pokey thing because it would cause them discomfort and pain. And so I discovered at that moment that everything pretty well that we would call an animal uh, moves away from pain. So those are at least our higher life forms. And then, of course, time goes by and science gets more and more sophisticated and we find out that plants move away from uncomfortable situations. Uh, any gardener, Chuck knows that, he knows his plants turn towards the sun because that's number one food source for plants is the sun. They can't do anything with the chemicals you give them if they don't have any sun. So they move towards the sun. And if you put them in the shade, they do everything they can to get into the sun. So maybe we have some plants that are higher life forms. So what is it that we can go out and kill without worrying about it? Well, maybe a rock. Have you ever heard a rock scream? I have. Just take a big sledgehammer and beat on it. You hear all kinds of unhappy sounds coming from that rock. Matter of fact, all the rocks I've met are very happy being just the size they are. Whether they're little bitty ones or they're great big ones, they're pretty happy with that size. So this creates a dilemma. People would like things to be simple. It's just, that's just the way it is. It would be so good. I can remember saying to people, when I wasn't that much younger than I am now, if you just tell me what you want, just make it black and white for me. If I do this, I'm doing good. If I do that, I'm doing bad. And then I don't have to worry about thinking. Of course, I didn't say I don't have to worry about thinking. I just said, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Well, life is that complicated. We do have our houses get infested by vermin. We do have, is mold? alive? Sure it is. And we have houses that get condemned because people didn't know there were mold in it until it was making people sick. But if you know that you're getting mold in the house, you can have it treated and you get rid of the mold, or you can abandon your house. There was a house out in Adelanto or Phelan or someplace that just got so infected. I don't even understand it. Personally, I don't understand it. We live in the desert. And this stuff grew in the walls of this house that the people had to walk away from the house. Nobody could live in it. It was that unhealthy. And what are we going to do? I think they still own the property. So maybe they could tear the house down, but then it would... What are we going to do about the mold? It's kind of like in India, you know, where they have a temple to rats. And everybody goes out and feeds the rats, and all the rats in the neighborhood know that's a safe place to live. If nobody's going to put a trap out for them, it creates a dilemma. And the Buddha said that there is no easy answer since you breathe and since you drink water and since you eat. But what you can do is that you can respect and honor the lives that you're taking. And I remember the first temple I lived at was a Japanese temple and I started studying a little bit of Japanese culture. And one of the things I was amazed at is the people that thought that anything Japanese was good. Which is very silly to think anything just because it's Japanese is good. It's like saying anything that's Mexican is bad. You know, and I just learned a couple weeks ago that uh, tortillas, you know, they, they put a lye with the corn and it turns into protein. I, I have to check with my brother, the biochemist, about that. but. Louis Mung told me that. They didn't know they were doing that in the processing. They made the food even better 
by the processing. Uh oh, there's going to be people that don't agree with the processing thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, the book, when I found out about the Japanese, that they would go in, in a certain season, they would go into the forest and they would hunt uh, wild pigs. And they would do a big ceremony before they went out to hunt the wild pigs for the, whatever the festival was. Uh, the thing that, that uh, impressed me was that they went out and they asked, uh, they apologized to the pig and they asked for the pig's forgiveness before they went and hunted the pig. I was really impressed with that. And, and I could possibly see that uh, fishermen, you know, in Japan, 99% of the of, uh, what we would call animal protein is fish because they're on an island. They don't have room to have cows. So they, they need to grow sweet potatoes and, and wheat and things and rice and things like that. So they're eating a lot of fish. And, and I have no doubt that the, the fishermen pray because they go to the, the shrines for Khan, which is Kuan Yin. And they pray at the shrines before they go out. They pray for safety. But they also apologize for the lives they have to take. The mind is an incredibly powerful thing. We create our total reality in the world with our mind. People that think other people are less than them can create suffering beyond belief. Just think of every despot that has ever existed and the amount of suffering they cause in the world and the taking of life, and you've heard me talk about the taking of life, it's never about the person that's killed, it's about all the people that suffer because the person was killed. I watched the news, which is moderately depressing, and there's a 12-year-old that gets shot. Well, there's nothing to rejoice about there, but at least we believe that that 12-year-old will continue on and be reborn and have another life form that's absolutely no comfort to the mother and the father who's going out trying to buy a shotgun so he can go hunt down these gangbangers to avenge his daughter that's no comfort to him and the brother and sister left behind that's no comfort and all the kids in the classroom that get informed I mean you know in our schools today when we have violence like that they bring counselors in to talk to the kids because they finally learned that death affects everyone. I mean, our U.S. government is making noises about actually taking care of our soldiers coming back. And, and I, find it, I find that one totally amazing. You know, we had people that came back mentally injured from World War I. We know that because we talked about shell shock. We have soldiers coming back from World War II and Korea, mentally changed, and they're never going to change back. It isn't like they had a bad day. And then we had all these people coming back from Vietnam, and uh, not only did we ignore the fact that they might need a little extra help, we spit at them, spit on them while we were at it. And so now we have soldiers coming back, and the government is overwhelmed about what they did. Because those young people were over there, and some of them have done three, four, and five tours. Changed for the rest of their existence. And we want to pretend that, well, you know, if you just, if you have a positive attitude, get a job, and watch a little TV, everything will be fine. No, it won't. The act of violence changes people. The act of taking a life, particularly a human life, is such an absolute thing that there's really no way you can recover from it in the sense that you pretend it didn't happen. What you can do is learn to accept what happened and you can learn to let go of the pain. And you can learn to stop being angry. And you can learn to be soft again. But these are all things that have to be learned and if you don't have anybody to support you, you're in big trouble. And I had a phone call <laughs> yesterday. I'm on, I'm on my soapbox, and I'm on my soapbox on my soapbox. I got a phone call yesterday from a guy wanting to collect money for the soldiers returning. 
He said, if you could just donate $15. And I said, why aren't we having to collect money for the soldiers returning? He says, well, you know, they don't get taken care of. I said, well, yeah, well, the problem is they don't get taken care of. Instead of collecting money, everybody should be calling and visiting their congressional people and telling them how unhappy they are about this. And that we really don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats because we didn't care what the soldier was when we sent them overseas. So let's stop playing that silly game and take care of these people. Well, the Buddha saw all that. We don't have guilt. That's what we don't have. If you do something which other people would call bad, and we would call causing harm, there isn't guilt because you've got enough to carry within yourself as it is. And But the Buddha realized when he started talking about the Eightfold Path, he said, don't really want to be a butcher. And that's, that's the obvious one because you have to, in the old days, the butchers would kill the animal and, and cut the animal up. But then he said, you don't want to be a soldier. Because soldiers, by definition, have to kill other people. It's not an issue of right or wrong. And you don't want to be a policeman. Because at some point, you might be required to harm someone. And we're such a fickle country. I mean, this is the year of the cops that got too carried away and somebody died. Like this is a brand new event. Okay, and I, I, won't, I won't go into that one, but the thing is, it's there. That's all we're hearing about, is this person, too much force was used. This happened, that happened. The Buddha said, at the same time said, that all these people are valuable. They're not any less than you, but you have to be an extraordinary person to trade in violence and not be changed. And so the simple way to go is to stay away from any trade where you have to practice violence. And even better, find a trade where you have practiced service. Chuck was in a trade because he was in medicine where he practiced service. This one over here, I don't know if he ever helps anyone. He's got this PhD in psychology. <laughs> I don't know if he ever does anything with it, but that's service, that's helping people. And it's putting yourself on the line. And it's, and it's also putting yourself in a position that you have to share in your suffering. So now we really need a strong person. We need a person with clarity. We need a person with some kind of practice that helps them stay centered. We call it Buddhism. But other religions have ways they do that. But people have to practice something. You can't go around violence and absorb all of it. You have to be able to let it go off and, and, and not internalize it. I was talking with Tom, too, on Thursday night at the class. And uh, we, we tend to go all over the place in the class with her and I. And I said, well, you know, it's like the famous story of the Buddha where the woman uh, came to him and, and uh, yelled at him because he had, and I told her there's two versions of the stories that I've read. One is that she had three or four sons and every one of them became a monk. And the other is she only had one son and he became a monk. And the woman came and said, what are you doing? You've ruined the rest of my life because I, I want, uh, I, I, that he was going to take care of me in my old age. And now I have no one to take care of me. And remember now, 2,500 years ago, there was no social service. There certainly wasn't any kind of care for the aged other than the family. And in one sense, the Buddha destroyed that family structure. Now she has nobody to take care of her in her old age. And she yelled at the Buddha and she cried. And probably stamped her feet, and who knows, maybe she threw something, and then she left. And Ananda got very upset. Ananda, the, the attendant of the Buddha, said, Lord, I don't understand. Why did you let that woman talk to you that way? 
She was very, very disrespectful. Why did you let her talk to you that way? Why did you let her express all that anger? And the Buddha said, didn't touch me. Her anger didn't touch me. So it just kind of sloughed off of him. And now we have the great misconception in the West. We were talking about that today in class. Uh, that uh, Tom Voy Mung talked about these weird different ideas that people are coming up with about Buddhism in different countries. Because he, uh, of course, is able to speak Spanish. And uh, he's looking at a website in Mexico. And they're coming up with some really interesting ideas of what Buddhism is. And he says, I don't know where they come up with these ideas. Uh, and so he was talking about that. And the Buddha just simply said, I don't accept her anger. And so somebody reading that a hundred years ago, because when I was a kid, I read this stuff about Buddhism that was, some of it was written a hundred years ago. It meant the Buddha didn't care. And Bui Mung, don't say those words you said. He said some rather vulgar words. He said, this is what this one guy is teaching down in Mexico. This is, and basically the Buddha doesn't give a darn. And if you just take it, you can take it that way. The Buddha said, I didn't accept her anger. You always have to remember that the Buddha was not like all the other religious teachers. There were no absolutes. He did not say, I have one pill that fits everybody. He did not say, I have one solution that works for everybody. He did not say, you always have to do this. You never can do that. Circumstances very often dictated how we conduct ourselves. Ananda was upset because the Buddha was yelled at. And so the Buddha addressed Ananda's problem. He said, don't think poorly of that woman. I did not accept her anger. I don't remember that he went any further than that with Ananda, because Ananda was upset. But you know what he did? He changed the rules. He said that no child can become a monk without the parent's permission. And there were no exceptions. No child can become a monk without their parents' permission. So a problem was brought to him and he solved the problem. We would like to think that he would go in and tell the child, okay, you have to go back to your mother. He was really a great conciliator, but he didn't do that. He just said, from now on, this isn't going to happen. People came to him and said, your monks are wandering around the country and it's raining and little plants are coming up and bugs. You know, in India at that time, they had a very interesting idea of how bugs uh, came in, how life came into being. Moisture and warmth was one of the ways. Okay, just poof, just magically appeared. They didn't understand seeds. I know that sounds weird because there had to be farmers out there casting seeds. But they'd see these things jumping up out of the ground and they go, oh, there's a lot of moisture and it's warm. Because in India when it rains, it's warm. So the Buddha said, okay, and a bunch of people complained. And he said, okay, and he went to his monks and he says, from now on during the rainy season, the rain season, we call it the summer training here, the monsoon, we will stay in one place. And so this tradition of getting together and practicing together and learning together and having the old teach the young all came out of a bunch of people that went to the Buddha and complained. I don't know of any time that people went to him and complained that he didn't pay attention to them. So my teacher, he just, he thought the Buddha was just the greatest thing in the whole world because he was so scientific in his approach. And then one night he says, Sandy sitting over there going, okay, I, this is okay, this talk's okay. But he was going to talk about the woo. And he didn't do it. Ha! You know me, I can meander all over the universe and come back to what I was going to do. He said there was a monk in China. And he was a student. It was actually in Hong Kong. And he was a student. 
And uh, he didn't have a whole lot of money because he was a monk. And so he went and he rented a room, but it was just barely what he could afford. Uh, it took pretty well all the savings he had. And the man of the house informed him that he was getting a good deal because the house was haunted and particularly that room was haunted. And so Tianan said, the monk said, if I get rid of the ghost, will you let me stay here for a year at no charge? Because he really only had about enough money to pay for his food. And, and the man said, absolutely. If you can get rid of that ghost, I'll give you one year rent free. And so the monk went, took a bath, got nice and clean, put on his nicest robes, burnt incense, began chanting. Did this for days. And as time went by, the man became more and more calm. And finally the monk said, the ghost is gone. There is no bad feelings here. Everything's okay. And the man said, we'll see. And time went by and there was no ghost there. And he stayed there for a year and Tianan said that the guy was so happy that he gave him an extra year. And I listened to that story and I said, uh-huh, okay. And then at another time he told another woo-woo story because at the beginning of the rain season, the beginning of the, of the training season, we do a thing uh, called a little ceremony marking the SEMA boundaries. And actually that's done anytime, like if you build a new uh, temple or a new meditation place, you go out and you mark the four boundaries for the place that you have. And if you check it out, most religions do that. They do some kind of ceremony of marking the boundaries. These two characters we have on either side of the room, they're called Dharma Protectors, and you can see one of them looks very ferocious because he has this tongue that's about two feet long. And those are the Dharma Protectors. And they're modeled after some generals that lived in China in the time of the Three Kingdom period. And so they are looked at as fierce. That's why they have a sword, if you look. They're fierce protectors of the Dharma. And the way they protect the Dharma is to protect the people that are practicing the Dharma. In other words, they don't go out and run down people who have bad things to say about the Buddha's teaching. They just uh, usually are around temples where you go in to keep out the negative people. Okay, And probably at one time in China, to come up on, these things are normally life size or bigger. So, you know, they look very ferocious and people would come up and they'd see those and they'd go, I'm not going in there. So we do a ceremony and we do, we do it here every year. And I even put up some, some bricks and put a little incense holder on top of the bricks a couple of years ago. We go out and we invite the Dharma protectors to protect us for the period of training. Okay? It's one of those ceremonies that's been going on forever. Tianan talked about how uh, when we were firebombing uh, Tokyo during World War II, towards the end of it, there was a lot of bombing going on, but it didn't look like the war was going to come to end, so you know the rest of that story. But he said there was a temple in Tokyo. Now, you have to realize that Tokyo is, was a city at that time made out of paper. The reason why when bombs went off in Japan, it was so ferocious is because uh, they didn't have a lot of wood. So they made wood frames and put paper over it. And so any flame, almost every, it's, it's estimated that every temple in Japan is burnt down at least once. Because they're made out of paper, right Kurt? You know, unless you went to a brand new one that was stucco. But Kurt used to go to Japan every year. Are you still doing that? Not every year. Not every year? Yeah, but he used to go over there, take his kids to stay with their grandparents, and he'd go sit in the Zen monastery and pretend he knew what he was doing. He said, I'm an American psychologist. Here I am in Japan. 
So they had these paper buildings that would burn down. Tiananmen said there was this one temple because it was, this is not a Japanese practice, marking the Sima boundaries. So that this one temple, for who knows what reason, decided, maybe they had a monk from China or something that stayed there. Every year they'd go out and mark the Sima boundaries. So when we started the really heavy bombing of Tokyo, they just about leveled everything around this temple, but that temple was never touched. As far as Tianan was concerned, it was because the Dharma protectors protected the temple. I don't know. But I do know that the mind is the most powerful thing you'll ever encounter. It can make your life a wonderful thing, or it can make your life hell. And it all starts and ends with the mind. It does not end start and end with any circumstances. It starts and ends with the way you perceive the world.